Hello guys, welcome back to episode 525,623 of Trek Yards. I am Captain Foley. For you guys, talking Trek, future Trek, past Trek, confusing timelines Trek, and modern Trek. What we're talking about today, we're doing our weekly review, Stuart. We're here again, same time every week. We are, and this one, this review is for episode 12 of season 2 of Discovery, uh, and it is entitled, I just had the title up. Through the Valley of the Shadows. So 12 or 14, so we're right at the end. The the climactic finale is about to begin. So Stuart, your overall nope. thought on this episode? Nope, you first this time. You always ask me first. I, I do. Okay, fine. This, this time it's your turn. Okay. I just want to hear your thoughts first. Um, I think it was a mediocre episode with lots of plot problems again. Not as many as last week, but less, they did less. Again, we're getting back on the season one problems of they're not fully thinking things through. Um, but a few nice things, but mediocre and definitely not the quality we had at the start of season one, which is a shame. It's so. funny. I rather, I rather like this episode and I didn't see many, many issues with it at all. Um, and actually last night on my first, uh, reaction review, I gave it a nine out of 10. I really enjoyed it. There's a lot of things that are really cool in this episode and yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure there are problems that I might've missed that you'll point out. Um, but it might affect my score a little bit. We'll see. Because, you know, sometimes glaring plot holes and things will do that. But overall, I really enjoyed it. Uh, we got to see some old faces again that we hadn't seen for a while. You can really feel the season they ran out of money. Because this episode is very much a scene with something visual, a conversation in a, in a quarters. A scene with something visual, a scene in someone's quarters. A scene with something visual, a scene in an office. One very cheap scene, one more expensive scene. So it, it's very chatty chatty, which is not when we love good character dialogue that's why i think episode raises above slightly than last week because there's more good character stuff but you can see again how they're really stretching their budget which i think actually kind of works it's more of a Star Trek 2 vibe where of you know money what it needs to be the rest of its character stuff good uh although that said they could have put some money into the d7 shots or shot with an s more than one. I think that, and there's something else, I think, that we're just a deliberate uh, slap in the face to fans. Um, kind of like a, you made us do this, but so here's the very minimal. Here you go. There it is. We didn't want to do it, but there's a D7, a ship that looks Klingon. That's what it felt like, almost. It felt like a little bit of a, a slap to the fans. And also, and even uh, the whole conversation about the red, the red uh, spheres... And the whole, when Michael said, you know, speculating about this is pointless and useless, it almost was a jab at the fans. Like, us sitting here for, like, how many weeks going, who's the Red Angel? Uh, it just, it seems like they're trying to, they're poking us with with a stick going, you guys are dumb, we don't like you. That's what it feels like. Well, it's also different writer people, different objectives. I mean, those that started this mystery at the start, though, those first five episodes, got fired. And so those who are paying it off are different people. And so it, the focus is all changing a little bit. Well, I found it very odd. Pike says, "Ah, oh, this is this is this is a signal four out of seven, and we have to follow it. And and there's only two or three more. And it's like, what, the, what are you on about? What makes you think there's seven? There were seven at the start of the season, but you knew where they all were. So if you knew where they all were, and it's the same seven, just visit the seven. I'm gonna disagree a little with you there because they have been showing up." Uh, one at a time where they initially were. So there's a pattern that they're all going to eventually show up at some point. They didn't say, seven singles appeared and no one said in the first episode, and one was at Saru's home planet, one's in the, one's at a Klingon colony. Like, they just showed seven and they knew where they were, but never made a mention of it. And yet they were always surprised. They knew so roughly where they were on the galactic map, but as they, that's that's the feeling I get. And then as they show up again, they're, they're, they're pinpointed and then they can get to them. But then, how would they know it was at the specific planet if they couldn't detect the exact location then, and it's still that far away? How could they detect it yeah. now, that far I'm away? Not sure. See, I'm I mean, sure. there's a disconnect between the thought process of at the start of the season, and the end of the season, thing, and then they jump, they spore jump, something they're not meant to be doing, and hurts my city little. Just, just, oh yeah, I'm just gonna jump there. O okay, what? Well, it's just, it's just like the the warp drive thing in TNG. Um. <laughs> You know, we got to limit our warp speed. And then, like, two episodes later, the Admiral's like, you have permission to break the warp speed limit. And then it's never referred to again. <laughs> and then, yeah, when they jumped in, I was like, really? They spore jumped? It's exactly what I said to Sylvia. And then later, the conversation in the mess hall, um, Jet Reno is like, congratulations on another spore jump. Thought you'd be excited. Yes, and I killed it's... 18 life forms in an alternate <laughs> universe. I'm real excited. 
but it doesn't matter now because we have Hugh back. So yay! Um, yeah, bit of a disconnect there. And then they they warped Enterprise at the end from the innards of Klingon space. That's a whole different problem with distance and travel. I mean, they just don't care where they are, do they? Well, uh, they didn't actually warp anywhere yet. They were still sitting there, so. Oh, sure. But they, well, they, well, they said set a course. I mean, we can assume they're going to warp yeah. to Discovery. Why did Control send a Section 31 ship deep into Klingon space within shuttle warp distance in a few hours? Well, we've, that... we've talked about... We've talked about shuttle warp distances before. That's just that's just a plot convenience to get people there. Let's hop in the car and go. It doesn't make sense, the distances. You can't possibly say the ship's not in Klingon space. I doubt Lorel gave him permission to, you know, warp... Th- you know what I mean? Lorel gave him permission to be here, not to send a shuttle to a Section 31 ship. It's like, this is all dodgy stuff. And why, you know, so they disconnected there a bit as well. And then when at the end they say, you know, all Section 31 ships are coming here. Oh, so they're going to come into Klingon space and we can destroy them. Cool. Yeah, almost their entire fleet, 30 ships, yeah. Oh, dear. It's not like the Klingons have hundreds. In the, just, just go to Kronos. They'll come to us and we'll blow them up. Nice. So already going to walk out of Klingon space to get to Enterprise, which is near Earth, which doesn't know it needs to rendezvous you. So that's going to be days and days and weeks of travel just to meet, meet up. Yeah, I agree. But the, the overall enjoyment factor for this episode outweighed, <clears throat> for me, the plot holes. Like, yeah, the, the warp shuttle, the, the shuttle going to the Section 31 ship. Silly little things like that I didn't even really consider uh, because I was just enjoying the episode. That's what this this team is relying on. It's it's people not to think it through, not to really take notice, which is Trek always pay attention to the details. And this show is actively ignoring the details just to tell the story. But if it, if it can't uh, sustain the sort of scrutiny, then, you, you know, you write in these problems. Like, they're writing the show. They could easily not write in the problems or write in solutions. You know what I mean? Like, have this planet be on the edge of Klingon space rather than this monastery and be a new place, and then they can just warp across the border. And then, you know, they say to Lorel, yeah, uh, you know, yes, we'll send our D7 to take you there because, you know, we've got a big battleship. We also want to kill Control. We'll send a ship with you to the Section 31 ship, which is obviously a trap, and it's not even not even a joke how obvious that, that is. Um, the D7's cool, though. Props for that. Yeah. Yeah, I wish we would have seen a better shot of it instead of the shot we knew knew we were going to see. And that's it. And just the throwaway line of dialogue, like, D7 with Chancellor Rawls here. Oh, sweet. <laughs> it's not even like, would you look at the new ship, the new D7s? Those are those look formidable. The brand the spanking scans, new. Yeah. Yeah, sensor scans indicate they're pretty powerfully armed or something. Moving well, on. <laughs> well, as we know, Stuart, in Discovery, you can scan into Klingon space flawlessly. So they, they've they've seen the D7 on their sensors for days, weeks, months now, and they're not remotely surprised. Speaking of, not at all surprised, Stuart, time crystals, native uh. to a Klingon Empire planet. There's hundreds of them, guarded by a Klingon sect, one that managed to keep its, keep its time stuff secret from Worf, who went there for a different reason, even though there's only one building on the planet, and they're also the masters of time uh, keeping it safe. I thought I thought that was a problem at first, and I I was like, oh, seriously, this whole planet's just teeming with time crystals, and then they kind of went on to explain a little bit later that uh, to nine like most of the Klingons, these are considered a myth. They're they're basically guarded by these monks, and so mostly nobody knows about them because otherwise, yeah, you'd have every Klingon commander in the fleet going to this planet getting time crystal. You're trying to use it to go back in time and take control of the Federation or, the, you know, Kronos. So are you okay with the time crystals now then? Being an abundant source um, inside Cleon space? I'm more at ease with it because uh, I have the feeling that they're very rare and this is like the only place they are. But but no, I'm more at ease with it now. I mean, it's it's cool the way they have it set up in a cathedral. It's almost, it feels like a Jedi temple almost, mm. like a Jedi Jedi artifacts room. Mm, I like <laughs> That's that. the, the vibe I got from it. But but yeah, at first, at the first thing, it kind of, red, red alert sirens went off in my head. Like, really? Really? And, and, and by TNG time, it's not necessarily that uh, maybe they got destroyed, I don't know. But, I mean, you've got to assume so. Uh, the, the thing about the the crystals is just like season one, and again, a really odd problem. You know, we're running out of spores. No more spores. Oh, let's make a planet full of spores. Cool, infinite energy. Yeah. Oh no, time mm. crystals—the rarest thing ever. Oh my yeah. god, created by fourth dimensional <laughs> beings. 
I yes. guess, in Klingon space on a Klingon planet. So rare, there's a planet full of them. Oh, wow, that really devalues that hugely. <clears throat> and it's not totally without merit. I mean, in TNG and Endgame, uh, Janeway goes to see a Klingon scientist who's working on this chronoton deflector, so a time-traveling deflector. So it could be that a few scientists <clears throat> are still in the know. They still are experimenting with it a little bit, but they're, they've definitely not gone <laughs> to the route of being maniacal about it. Um, so you can tie that in a little bit with the with the end game of Voyager. Yeah, but, but if that if that thing was powered by well, a the time crystal does is is in itself a time traveling ability. You wouldn't need chronoton thingies to do it. Like the suit lets you travel a person through the suit's generating it, but the time crystal's powering it. Uh, if that if that device is powered by time crystal, then Voyager have time crystal, then Voyager could use time travel. Like, like, because it's implied that that it's, it's implied that 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 chronoton thing burns out when they travel. So the, it's it's very you know prototype tech. Lucky it worked. It creates a rift. Moving on. It's nothing like supernatural. It's just basic time tech. Yeah, it was a nice enough tie-in though. Uh, just the fact that she went to see a Klingon scientist about it, I, I thought was interesting. Um, it could just be there's, there's a shard or two left for some reason. Like maybe there was an a, somebody attacked this planet, destroyed most of the monastery or, or the crystals at least um i don't know I, there, there's there's ways to get around it but i just thought it was a nice tie-in with the klingons um and sylvia pointed that out as soon as she heard that this this place was full of those time crystals she's like where did jane go to get that that thing in the last episode of voyager i'm like i don't know so she went to look it up and there was no ni place listed that, that she went uh because it would have been cool if it was this place That's, but yeah it's a bit for the sake of it it would have been better if it was the guardian forever's planet and that was remnants yeah. of like shards of him that had been shattered, and he just wasn't, you know, he the guardian knew he couldn't reveal himself yet, so he went into standby, you know, low power mode, and they pulled a crystal out of the ground. That would be like, oh, yeah, that works. That, that, that would have been way more clever, absolutely. Um, and and I love that you said most Klingons don't know about, it, although it wasn't overly difficult because a Klingon got one on Kronos years ago, and then the Federation stole it. So enough Klingons know it's real. To get one, use one, develop it. So it's not exactly a secret. If the people that need it. So they, because they said the clones chose not to do time tech. That was a choice. But you can just go get one. Although you go crazy if you do. But it seems the crazy bit is just you see a bad future you might have, and choose to either have it or not. So it's not re like I, I was expecting really bad things. But in fact, the the point of wanting the crystal to get the crystal is absurdly easy. Like it's completely effortless. I was like, oh, huh. Yes and no. And, I, I, mean, and I also don't buy for a second that by touching a time crystal, the timeline's now set. <laughs> that doesn't that doesn't have any bearing on anything. Yeah. He now knows what's going to happen. It, he can now choose not to do it. Like, if you show someone the future, by touching them, it doesn't make that future full. Otherwise, then, surely, Michael's mum could walk in there, find the crystal. Oh, look, I do destroy control. Touch it. Yay, that time is now set. It's like, what does that mean? Time's malleable. If that's the whole point of this season, it's been changing. You know, Michael being not killed shows it's malleable. So they're, they're throwing these things that don't work. It wouldn't, it wouldn't show, it wouldn't show her that she destroyed control. It would show her something about her future and how she died or how she gets affected by, by future events. Provising that she destroys control and it's all good. And, you know, because then you'd be setting it. Like, I don't, I don't see how that makes any sense that this crystal could set the future. Speaking of then. Uh, what did you think? We act actually saw Pike's incident and actually saw Pike. Toss-ish Pike. I gotta say, I called it. Like, literally when they walked in the time crystal room, I'm like, he's gonna see his future. And Sylvia's like, yeah, that'd be cool. <laughs> uh, and sure enough, yes. Uh, and they, they doubled down on everything. They used the, they reused the engine room or the spore room from Discovery. Uh, they use the cadet badges that Tilly was wearing. This is even though, even though this is in the future. They use a very JJ esque looking uniform on Pike. They didn't have the, they didn't have anything like like they doubled down on their aesthetic. When this was the perfect opportunity to show the the, the brighter uniforms, you know, show a little bit of a progression. Didn't get any of that, which was a shame. But I really liked the scene. I thought it was uh, interesting. Uh, and then when I saw the chair in the background, I'm like, oh, they're gonna screw this up. And no, the chair when it when it comes up to him, it's a great reimagining of that original chair. And even the makeup uh, for him Ugh. is terrifying, but close and like 
a nice visual update from the 1960s stuff to be believable. Like Better it was than really Venus. well done. Better than Venus, oh, I think. Absolutely. Um, so, so yeah, I really enjoyed that. And the fact that it, 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 it basically did break Pike. Like, how do you continue? Yeah. How do you continue on in life knowing that that happens to you for sure? Put the whole locking time, <laughs> future time in, you know, um, cause he was terrified when he scrambled back, uh, really well acted by the way. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and at and the, the end and the haunted scene at the end where he's just, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. What I saw was for my eyes on like really, really interesting. Like it just, it, it expands so much on his character. The fact that he chose to do, a, do that and then <clears throat> knows that not in too long in the distant future, cause he didn't look too much older that this is going to happen to him. I thought, I thought it was great. I thought it was really well done. I'm glad they showed it. Um, and that's one of the reasons I really love this episode because again, it's like the Talos four episode. It kind of ties in with the original and it just, they, they, they did a good job with it. So yeah, I was surprised um, because I, I I didn't know I was I was expecting a, a more difficult challenge for him, and so this was like, oh, they're doing this route, huh? Uh, I thought it was brave of them to show the chair. I think they did a, a really good job. That's exactly the style you should be doing for sort of visual update rather than radical. But again, different team, different you know, multiple different teams ago is when this aesthetic started. Yeah, I think the scene it. It was limited by the discoveryness by using the same room, which didn't quite work. The uniform choice, yep, didn't quite work. Uh, the the reuse of the corridor didn't quite work for that setup. Don't think it should be in that corridor. But the if you t- if you strip away the low budget feel and um, have to reuse because of low budget, it thematically was excellent. Visually, it left a little bit to be desired, and like you say, it should have been that was their chance. I mean, it would have been better to do a you know green screen TOS room. You know that was their chance. So let's you know you you, you want to you want to win fan moments like that. Now you're literally saying this is now in TOS era, and so everything everything needs to be TOS era. We're not pre TOS anymore. And I was definitely uh, I was like well, mm, he's wearing a JJ uniform. That's interesting. Or he's a very close, clearly inspired. Which is like well you shouldn't use JJ uniforms because they they're not that's not representative of the timeline that they're from. Mm. Well, in TOS, they made a point that it was a very old Class J ship, so it could definitely be Discovery era ship that he was on when the accident happened. It was an older. Remember that engineering room is though is for brand new spanking ships. That yeah, that's true. Been... That is true. That is true. A ten okay. year old is brand new. So should... You know what it would have added to this scene? To be fair, is to have a future where he sees where he grabs a time crystal and sees himself with Vina. You know, maybe having a picnic with a horse, and goes, "That's that can't possibly be the future." And the guy says, well, if you take the time crystal, you're setting the future. And he goes, okay, fine. He grabs it. And as he grabs it, and you see it kind of do this, shush, and it locks the time in, he gets a flash of himself in the chair that it didn't that it didn't show him. Um, but then again, that wouldn't strengthen his character by saying that he knew that this was going to happen. But it would have been interesting to have some kind of tie-in with Vina and him be skeptical as to whether it's true, because there's no way that can possibly be my future. That's my past. Yeah, it's, it's tricky. The way they did it works great, again, thematically. He's a very strong... I mean, he's the best character in the show. I mean, he's literally destroyed everyone else in terms of characterization, in terms of acting. Like, he's just, yeah. <laughs> you know, the best thing about either season, easily. Um, although, it, it does feel a little bit anticlimactic, though, because we know that he does get his happy ending, and so seeing him all burned is like... Yeah. Yes. And then you're wondering, but why did they give Aerium a, Aerium a new android body and they didn't all give Pike a new body? Why did they fix, you know, uh, Laurel's face with her scarring and not fix Pike's face? You know, all the now, now this is almost redundant in the Discovery alternate timeline universe vibe, having him in this this chair because it doesn't fit with what we see in Discovery. No, that would have been bad. I mean, we saw a guy in Discovery in a wheelchair, a standard wheelchair, so we know that either some things can't be fixed or they cho- people chose not to. Uh, and it could be that he has severe radiation damage to something in his brain that he can't... They can't do the Arium update. For the most part, good uh, of that stuff. Just Time Crystal stuff. They've really... Like, again, they've they've chosen this plot line. You know? It, it's a shame that they went this route. And it really isn't good for the overall Trek continuity, what they've done here and how they've presented it. And it's a shame... But they put themselves in more corners, and it's just so weird. Like with season one, to create an ultra rarity, which creates a really interesting plot device. You know, we've only got three spore jumps left with the spores, and that's it. Excellent. Oh no, we can never get down the time crystal. Oh, we found another planet. Them. Oh. Because I was instantly I was thinking, well, the time crystal is destroyed in Michael Burnham's mother's suit. 
but I doubt that is what allowed it to travel across the galaxy in real time. So why can't you just travel to the planet and get another crystal if they're that abundant? Next next plot point though, the section 31. The other plot, I, I guess. There's multiple plots here. <laughs> Thoughts on that entire spiel? I should have saw it coming. Didn't until like right before the reveal. Um, but... That's good. You, you saw Pike, I saw Section 31, so I'm glad we, we, we spotted Brown what we saw there. That's good. Don't yeah. feel as dumb now. Lieutenant Gans coming back, uh, from the tactical officer from the Shinjo. I was like, okay. I thought At first I thought it was Connor, the guy that ki killed twice. Killed in the Prime and the Mirror Universe. It's like, how is he still? But it's no, it's not him. So it makes me wonder if uh, Control, because at the end, 30 ships come in, 30 Section 31 ships. Makes me wonder if Control has control of all of them, which it probably does. And did it, it did it jettison or eject the crews, crews of each one of them? Because it would probably have to. So we can assume that Giorgio's still alive. I think Leland's still going to show up. His body is going to show up because uh, it escaped on the ship last week. That could be the why the reason Section Thirty One no longer exists. They all got killed. They got spaced by control. This it was interesting. It was less, it had less more less of a, a Borg vibe this time, especially with the nanites at the end doing that little snake thing towards Burnham, which I liked because I I don't want it to be the Borg. I'm getting sick of hearing about the Borg. Um, we, you know, we could have done videos on it, but I I'm a hundred percent certain, just like I was hundred percent certain Michael Burnham was not the Red Angel that this is not the Borg. Like, I have no reservations that it's the Borg at all. And so since this episode, you, you can't say it's the Borg because the nanites can just flow out of you. That's so much more advanced than Borg nanoprobes. It's it's absurd. So it's not the Borg. <laughs> it's not. The one thing that kind of caught my attention was the fact that Control stated that it needed Michael Burnham. Uh, and the reason was because it couldn't account for her in its equations. She was an unknown variable. So it needed... It felt that her getting her... Uh, to help it recover the data from Discovery was the most viable solution. Um, but the fact that it, it considers her a variable, something that can't be controlled or predicted, interests me because I think it's still going to tie in with her using the Red Angel suit at some well, point. Well, they got a crystal now, and they know how to build the suits. Because they built but one. That's not what's going to happen, though. No. They've got a crystal. They're going to put it on Discovery and let Discovery drift for a thousand years till my her mom's time 950 years in the future she's going to grab the time crystal come back whether it's going to be the last episode that happens or next season i don't know but that's kind of my prediction but yeah so the, the 61 plot i thought it's good that we've got burnham doing her own thing because each episode is better when she's not leading the primary <laughs> cast because she yeah. uh, you know just diminishes them but allowing those these these three groups in fact you know anson Mont was great the secondary cast was great she was actually good, you know, in her in her bit of the Spock. And Spock is again well respected. He does smart things in smart ways for smart things. Well done, Spock. Well done, writers. But it you know, it's an obvious trap. I mean it, it's like and then the 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 plan I thought and as soon well, as soon as I beamed him on board, I was like, Oh, he's obviously an agent, like again, obviously, like it's not you know I didn't get that at all the first time they beat him on board, so But I thought the, the the plan was absolutely atrocious and made no sense. The control controls the ship, so what? And you can control a couple of systems, but the rest of them the con ship controls, and it knows you're there, and it can scan you, and it can kill you, it can beam into space, it can ingest on everybody. It's everything. It's letting you do all this stuff, and it's letting you create a separate little bit of the computer. And it doesn't know that, even though it's got complete control of the system except a couple of systems, and you can and it and the AI, which isn't, you know, in every system, will all go into a separate subsystem because computer code is like a big entity. It's not as if it stays in the things it's in and just copies and pastes. It moves. And then once you close it in, it hasn't thought about that plan and put backups of itself in every other system and then you get control. It was... It, nothing about it made sense, like, no. like remotely. It was an absolutely appalling plan. Um, I agree. I, like, it was just... It's, it's not even thought out. And I was assuming then that, uh, well, we, we then know that it didn't let Spock in to fight, so Control still in control of the ship, even though there was no Control. And I found it funny that Spock asked the computer, where's the Control? The computer's telling him. It's like, you tell the com you ask the computer, which was controlled by Control, to tell you about Control. It's like, well, it's lying to you. Obviously. What do you want? Um, so I was, I was amazed by all that although the battle bit was cool and i loved him talking to her and we'll analyze that in our live later i thought that was really fascinating i liked that he they brought down the invincibility level that leland seemed to have you can kill it just takes more power than the nanites you know nanites aren't just insta heal 
you know, there is a certain amount of weapon to, to kill. Um, although, as soon as the, the Nanites came out of a body, his body, I thought, oh, it's that easy. So why isn't he... You know, what was the point? Seriously, in any of this, why isn't... If the, if the entire point was to get Michael Burnham, then as soon as he's on the shuttle, as soon as he touches her, yeah. Yeah. Nanites into a body, mission done. There's no reason for any of this bit of the plot to happen if he can just put out Nanites. If, if this other guy wasn't even important... Like the, that entire bit was just filler. And, the only and, the only yeah, reason I could God. see for that to happen was the fact maybe Control was trying to learn a little bit about what they knew, uh, so buying a little bit of time trying to get some information out of them. But even that doesn't really work. So because you would just put the notes inside each of them and then learn their memories. I mean, there's quicker ways. I don't know if you can read if the nanites can read their memories. I don't think there's that kind of interaction with physical like a. Uh, uh, flesh. I, yeah, I don't think so. You don't think it? I mean, but it can, but it can control their brain because the brain is what's creating the speech and everything else. <laughs> well, maybe, 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 maybe. But... So I'm sure it can access their memories at all. I mean, how, how would Leland? How would fake Leland function if he couldn't remember everything? I guess he would have knowledge of control, but then you're downloading the control memory into Leland's brain, which is either a construct of some chip it created nanites or his brain. So I think it. You know, it's not not far to assume it can read their. It has access to their memories, so it, that entire plot was just there. Yeah. It didn't make any sense. Yeah. And at the end, um, deep inside Klingon space, thirty ships, what decloak? Tell them that they're there. Well, they weren't decloaking. They were just incoming. They even said they're they're incoming. What does that mean? They're on their way. They're warping in. So you can detect warp signatures from through the entire Klingon Empire into Federation space, and how do they know the Section Thirty One ships then? And why do they all pop me. up? me. I just I just report what I see. I don't write the damn stuff. Yeah, um, <laughs> I was like, wow. Well. And as soon as that happened, I was like, oh great. Well, call Starfleet. Say, hey, can we get our seven thousand ships? How many have you got available? Six hundred, two hundred. Great. Because if they're chasing us, we'll just spore jump to the fleet location. It has to chase us. It's not chasing anyone else. We have 300 ships, and then we'll destroy the 30 ships. Like, I didn't feel any tension at the end. It's like, you're not renegades. You've got Starfleet, which is unaffected by control, and the Clone Empire, which wants to help you. You're not outgunned. Why Why? Why was that the plot at the end, Stuart? And what did you think about that reveal about destroying the ship and outgunned and Enterprise? And... I thought it was great. Yeah. I thought it was great I thought about it. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, it's a strange... But that's the thing, it's the rush. It's like, let's get to the end. Let's get to this epic fight next episode. But it's like, no, no you've... Starfleet ships. Final narrative, the Lorel the, the coming back. What do you think about her... Her-ness in this episode? Didn't care. <laughs> it's just, it's a... Character doesn't interest me. I don't know. <clears throat> um, sure, it was great to see her, I guess. But I don't think she adds anything really at this point. Um, the whole Tyler Vock thing's done, so she even pointed out that, yeah, I, I thought about it. I, I love Vok, but he's not around anymore. You, obviously, are, will love Burnham forever, so bye. And now that their kid's all grown up with, like, a name and all that junk, it's like, woo. Which was cool. That was a fun little side twist, though very easy, like, oh, I know one guy like that. Yes, me. Cool. Well, like, it blows the it blows the whole albino from Deep Space Nine theory out the window that everybody's been <laughs> talking about. What about uh, Stamets and Tig and um, mm. and uh, Hugh. Uh, Hugh? Thank you. The name that rhymes with poo. Yeah, poetry in motion. <laughs> uh, I thought it was great. Um, I'm glad they touched on it. Uh, I love that she's like, yeah, you know, my wife died. Whatever. You've got a second chance. Don't screw it up. And leaves it leaves it at that. So. I thought that was good. Very, very short, sweet, to the point, done, good, let's move on. Well, it's, it's good they're having little beats on other things while staying focused on the main story. This was very, like, main story's little beats. Although when it came to Hugh, I thought she was being so unfair to him, it was unreal. It's like, he died, he is not the same person, and here you are saying, look, just be yourself again, mate, come on, go, go get him. It's like, you have no right, Tig. You have absolutely no right. I was really disappointed in how that scene was. Ah, oh, I wasn't. She's she's just got that kind of brash character that says exactly what's on her mind. So it has no. I, I have no issues with it. But I, I think I think also that implies we're gonna get a nice ending to them in like a nice way. Like it's not gonna go dark. It's just gonna end with them being 
together again. Probably, probably, yeah. Uh, like I said, I loved it. Still going to give it a 9 out of 10. I really enjoyed the pacing. I enjoyed the the, the beats. I enjoyed I enjoyed the little moments, like with um, Q and T- Tig and, that, you know, that thing going on. Uh, the whole time crystal thing was kind of disappointing at first, but the way they kind of explained it, that most Klingons think, consider it a myth, I can totally buy that Not no nobody knows about it, or it is just that. It's a myth. So yeah, seeing Pike, uh, seeing his accident, seeing the fu- future chair, that was all great. Loved it, and I'm I'm on board. This is a good episode, better than I anticipated. Again, so yeah, for me, I say good acting, especially with Anson Mont. Um, reasonable pacing, although again cheap because you can see how they're balancing the budget, which I think still works as benefit, but it it feels like it does. Um, good character moments, just very poorly written, like thought out. Not so much written, the dialogue's pretty good, but just most of the threads just badly thought out with leaps in logic and not connecting things through the entire section. The one subplot doesn't work at all. Time crystals can work, but you're forcing a round peg into a square hole and it's just, uh, I think it's a, a bad, really bad sign that you know the lead up for season one is, gonna lead to, is leading to quite a poor payoff of plots being too easy and just it's it's a shame. It really is. They could have been much smarter, and they're being not smart, and it's a shame. Um, still a fun episode, but doesn't make it any smarter than season one. So what's your yeah. score out of ten? Oh, uh, see, mm, again, see the acting. I'm going to give like a solid eight because the acting's like still they they do deliver, and Burnham's getting better. CGI, beautiful stuff. Again, I give CGI nine. Very weird, very very well realized. Kronos or the you know Klingon planet. Very, very well realized D7. Uh, makeup, Klingons were better balanced. They had less absurd ridge stuff. They were slightly more balanced Klingons, which was good. Uh, but the plot stuff brings it all the way down. Um, so, I mean, when a show is dependent on plot and the plot's bad, it's like, well, you can't give it a good score, so I'm going to have to give it a six. It's like, I mean, it's mediocre, but slightly better with a few of the nice bits like the pike, cage, the, the space shots are nice, um, but, you know, some massive holes that they're writing in for some reason. So next week, though, excited for as as they often tease you. It's like the next the cool things next week. So hopefully we'll we'll see the final two part of kick ass. We're gonna see that budget realized in the next two episodes for sure. All right, guys, I think that's it. Put your comments down below. What did you think of this episode? What would you give it a out of ten? And um, love to love to see your your thought process and hear your comments. And don't forget to join us tonight at five p.m. Eastern Standard Time if you're watching this on the Friday <laughs> when it's released um, to join our, our live discussion where we break it down scene by scene, follow our notes, have a good discussion on it. And uh, again, love to hear your input on that and c- come and join us to, and help us with super chats. So we get your question read and your comment seen uh, and a good way to interact with us. So, um, and uh, until we well, can also support us on Patreon. You know, don't have to just join us for the super chats. You can support us monthly or one time to or buy a shirt down below, or buy an Eagle Moss down below. All the great ways help us out and help us make more of these shows. And hopefully after Discovery's finished for Season 2, we'll look at other Trek shows, and that'll be a lot of fun if you guys keep supporting us via Super Chats and such. So, yes. thanks so much. Yes, and like, subscribe, super mm. like, subscribe, share, and notification mm-hmm. icon. Very important. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So until next time, guys, I'm Captain Foley. I'm Connor Kongs. Bye, guys. Bye, everybody.